When we first got word that my wife's sisters were in trouble, it felt like the ground was shifting beneath us. The business they had poured their hearts into, a small but promising boutique clothing line, was teetering on the brink of collapse. My wife, Emily, was devastated. She had always been close to her sisters, Emma and Kate, and their success was something she took pride in, as if it were her own. Seeing the stress lines etched deeper into her usually smooth face made it clear that this wasn't just a problem for them, it was our problem too. Emily is a force of nature beautiful, smart, and incredibly driven. Her sisters aren't much different, though each of them brings something unique to the table. Emma, the eldest, is the brains behind the operation, with a keen eye for design and trends. Kate, the youngest, has the charisma and energy to sell anything to anyone. Emily, being the middle sister, always had a knack for keeping them grounded, balancing out their strengths and weaknesses with her level-headedness. Together, they were supposed to be unstoppable. But now, it seemed their combined efforts weren't enough. The business had always been a risky venture. The fashion industry is unforgiving, and although they had a loyal customer base, the costs of production and marketing were squeezing them dry. They tried to expand too quickly, taking out loans they couldn't afford to pay back when sales didn't meet expectations. The pressure mounted as the debts piled up, and soon they were drowning. I could see the fear in Emily's eyes each time she got off the phone with her sisters, and I knew I had to do something. I've always been good with numbers and planning, so it was natural for me to step in and offer my help. Emily didn't even need to ask I could see how much this was hurting her, and by extension, hurting us. I spent countless nights poring over their financial statements, trying to find a way to turn things around. My own job was demanding, but I made time for this because I knew how much it mattered to her. I started injecting our savings into the business, hoping that with a little cushion, they could stabilize and regroup. But it wasn't just about the money. The real problem was that they had lost direction. Emma's designs, once innovative and fresh, had started to feel repetitive and out of touch with their audience. Kate's charm wasn't enough to sell a product that no longer resonated with customers. And Emily, despite her best efforts, couldn't provide the creative spark they needed to reignite the brand's appeal. The sisters were too close to the problem to see it clearly, and it became obvious that without outside help, the business would crumble. It was hard watching them struggle. Especially Emily. She'd always been the glue that held her family together. And now she was watching that glue weaken under the weight of their collective failure. I didn't want to see her suffer, so I doubled down on my efforts, trying to fix something that maybe couldn't be fixed. I wanted to be the hero, to save them from losing everything, even if it meant risking our own financial security. But deep down, I was starting to worry that no matter how much I invested whether it was money, time or emotional support this might be a losing battle. We spent hours together, discussing strategies, brainstorming ideas, and analyzing every aspect of the business. Emily brought her insight into fashion and branding, while I focused on the financials and operational aspects. Our living room became a makeshift war room, with charts, graphs, and notes scattered across the table. Every evening we would sit down after dinner, coffee in hand, and dive into the details. We were determined to leave no stone unturned. As the weeks went by, our partnership deepened. We communicated more openly, shared our fears, and celebrated small victories together. I started to appreciate just how much Emily cared about her sisters and how much she valued my input. We were no longer just husband and wife, we were partners in every sense of the word. This collaboration was bringing us closer, and I found myself feeling more connected to her than I had in years. It felt good to be working towards a common goal, and for a while, it seemed like we might actually turn things around. We made some tough decisions along the way like cutting back on unnecessary expenses and shifting the business's focus to a more niche market. Emily was relentless in pushing her sisters to innovate and think outside the box. She wasn't afraid to be tough on them when needed, and I admired her strength. We even hired a consultant to help us refine our strategy, using some of our remaining savings to ensure we were on the right track. It was exhausting work, but the progress we made fueled our determination. But as we became more engrossed in the business, I couldn't shake a growing unease. There were moments when Emily seemed distracted, her thoughts elsewhere, even as we were deep in discussion. She started taking calls late at night, stepping out of the room when her phone buzzed. At first I dismissed it as stress after all, we were both under a lot of pressure. But the frequency of these calls and her sudden shifts in mood left me wondering if there was something more going on. Despite our best efforts, the problems in the business persisted. Every time it seemed like we were making progress, another issue would arise, setting us back. 
production delays, supplier complications, and market trends that shifted faster than we could adapt all of these hurdles made it clear that our battle was far from over. Emily's sisters, Emma and Kate, were trying their best to stay optimistic, but the strain was starting to show. The stress of seeing their dreams unravel was taking a toll on them, and by extension, on our entire family. Emma, who had always been the most composed and level-headed of the three, began to crack under the pressure. Her once sharp instincts for design seemed dulled by the constant anxiety of keeping the business afloat. She second-guessed every decision, and the confidence that had been her hallmark began to wane. Kate, usually the lively and charismatic one, lost her spark. The pressure to keep up appearances and maintain sales in the face of declining demand was wearing her down. I could see the exhaustion in their eyes every time we met, and it was painful to watch. Emily, too, was struggling though she tried to hide it. She felt responsible for her sister's well-being and was doing everything she could to support them. But the weight of their collective burden was heavy, and it was clear that she couldn't carry it alone. I knew I had to step up, not just as a husband, but as the pillar holding them all together. I became the go-to person for every crisis, the one they turned to when things went wrong. Whether it was a late-night phone call to talk through a problem or a last-minute financial infusion to keep the lights on, I was there. The financial strain was becoming significant. I had already poured more money into the business than I had originally intended, dipping into our savings and even considering taking out a loan to keep things going. But more than the money, it was the emotional toll that was starting to weigh on me. I was constantly on edge, worrying about what would go wrong next and how I could fix it. Emily's sisters were relying on me more and more, and I felt a deep sense of obligation to not let them down, especially for Emily's sake. At times it felt like I was the only one holding things together. Emma and Kate were emotionally drained, and Emily, despite her strength, was beginning to falter. I became the rock they all leaned on, the one who reassured them when things looked bleak, even though I wasn't always sure of the answers myself. I found myself spending more time with them, not just working on the business, but also trying to lift their spirits to keep them from losing hope entirely. As the problems in the business continued to mount, it became clear that we needed to think outside the box if we had any hope of saving it. The conventional strategies weren't working every plan we tried seemed to stall or backfire. I knew that if we kept doing what we were doing we'd just end up deeper in debt with nothing to show for it. So I took a step back and started to rethink everything what if the solution wasn't about fixing what was broken, but about finding a completely new direction. I began researching unconventional business strategies, looking for anything that might give us an edge. I read about companies that had turned things around by pivoting to entirely different markets or by drastically altering their product lines. One idea in particular caught my attention the concept of limited edition, exclusive product drops. It was a risky move, but it played into the strengths of Emma and Kate Emma's creativity and Kate's ability to generate hype. Instead of trying to appeal to everyone, we would focus on creating high-demand, exclusive pieces that would be released in limited quantities. When I presented the idea to Emily and her sisters there was initial hesitation. They were used to doing things a certain way, and the idea of such a dramatic shift was intimidating. But the more I explained the potential benefits how we could generate buzz, create a sense of urgency among buyers, and differentiate ourselves from the competition the more they began to see the possibilities. It was a gamble. But at this point, we didn't have much to lose. We decided to give it a shot. Emma poured her heart into designing a new line that was bold and innovative, something that would stand out in the crowded market. Kate, with her natural flair for marketing, started to build anticipation on social media, teasing the upcoming release and generating excitement among their followers. Emily and I worked on the logistics, making sure that everything was in place for the launch. It was all hands on deck, and for the first time in a long while, there was a sense of optimism in the air. When the first limited edition drop went live, the response was beyond anything we had expected. The pieces sold out within hours, and the buzz online was palpable. Customers who had been drifting away came back, eager to be part of this new, exclusive club. The success of the launch gave us the boost we desperately needed. For the first time it felt like we were back in control, like we had found a way out of the mess we were in. The positive results from this new approach began to restore the sisters' confidence. Emma started to believe in her designs again, and Kate rediscovered her passion for selling. Emily, too, was relieved to see her sisters regaining their footing. The success wasn't just financial, it was emotional. With the business finally on solid ground, I felt a sense of peace that I hadn't experienced in what seemed like ages. The long, stressful nights were behind us, 
and for the first time in a long while, it felt like our lives were back on track. Emily and I had grown closer through this ordeal, working together to support her sisters and save their business. We had faced every challenge as a team, and the bond between us felt unbreakable. I was proud of what we had accomplished, not just for her sisters, but for our marriage. I truly believed that we had emerged from this stronger, more united, and ready to face whatever the future held. The nights that had once been filled with worry were now replaced with quiet evenings at home, where we could finally relax and enjoy each other's company. Emily seemed more at ease, and I took comfort in the knowledge that we had made it through the worst. We started talking about plans for the future, ideas for expanding the business, and maybe even taking a well-deserved vacation. The stress of the past months felt like a distant memory, and I was optimistic that we could move forward with a renewed sense of purpose and unity. One evening, after a small celebration marking a particularly successful month for the business, Emily and I were sitting on the couch, enjoying a glass of wine. The atmosphere was light, and I felt genuinely happy, content in the moment. But as the night wore on and the wine flowed, Emily's mood began to shift. She became quieter, more introspective, her usual easy smile fading into something more uncertain. I noticed the change, but before I could ask her what was wrong, she suddenly blurted out something that made my heart stop. You were so busy with the business. I needed someone, she said. Her voice slurred from the alcohol but heavy with a seriousness that cut through the haze. For a moment, I didn't understand. I sat there, staring at her, waiting for the punchline, but none came. Instead, she looked down, her eyes filling with tears. I've been seeing someone. A colleague. For a while now. The words hit me like a punch to the gut. My mind reeled, trying to process what she had just said. How could this be true? We had been through so much together we had fought side by side to save her sister's business, to save our family. And yet, here she was, telling me that while I was doing everything I could to support her, she had found comfort in someone else's arms. The betrayal cut deep, and I felt an overwhelming sense of disbelief, as if the ground beneath me had crumbled away, leaving me in freefall. Emily seemed to sense the devastation she had caused, and, in a desperate attempt to fix it, she reached out to me, her words tumbling out in a jumbled, tearful mess. But it's over now, she insisted, her voice pleading. It was just a mistake. You were so focused on the business, on helping my sisters. I felt alone. But now, everything's okay. We've fixed the business, and we can fix this too. We can be together again, like before. But I couldn't hear her. All I could feel was the weight of her confession crushing down on me, suffocating the sense of unity and trust that we had worked so hard to rebuild. The betrayal wasn't just about the affair, it was about the realization that while I had been fighting for our family, Emily had been slipping away, finding solace in the arms of another. The future that had seemed so bright just moments ago was now clouded by a dark, painful reality that I wasn't sure we could overcome. In the days that followed Emily's confession, I found myself retreating into a shell, pulling away from her emotionally. We continued to live under the same roof, going through the motions of our daily routines, but something fundamental had shifted. The trust that once bound us was shattered, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't look at her the same way. She had been my partner, my confidante, and the person I believed I could rely on no matter what. Now, I felt like I was living with a stranger someone who had kept a secret so devastating that it threatened to unravel everything we had built together. Our conversations became terse and functional, limited to the bare necessities. I avoided eye contact, keeping my emotions locked away behind a wall I was determined not to let her breach. Emily tried to reach out to explain, to apologize, but her words only seemed to deepen the wound. Every time she spoke of moving forward or healing, it felt like salt in an open cut. How could we move forward when the foundation of our relationship had been so thoroughly undermined? I wasn't ready to forgive, and I wasn't sure I ever would be. Instead of confronting the pain head-on, I began to search for ways to numb it, to distract myself from the betrayal that had taken root in my heart. I threw myself into work, spending longer hours at the office and diving into projects with a single-minded intensity, but no matter how much I buried myself in tasks, the sense of loss and anger gnawed at me, refusing to be silenced. I needed something more, something that would not only help me heal but also give me a sense of control, of power, in a situation where I felt powerless. As I distanced myself emotionally from Emily, I started to consider what I could do to protect myself, to ensure that I wouldn't be left vulnerable again. It wasn't just about healing it was about finding a way to turn the situation to my advantage. The idea of getting something out of this mess, of not just surviving but somehow coming out on top, began to take root in my mind. I started to weigh my options, 
thinking about how I could leverage the situation to secure my own interests, both emotionally and financially. One option that crossed my mind was to renegotiate our financial arrangement. After all, I had poured a significant amount of my own resources into saving her sister's business. I began to wonder if I could use that as a bargaining chip, to ensure that I wouldn't walk away from this with nothing. The thought was cold, calculating, but in my current state, it felt like a necessary step to protect myself from further hurt. I couldn't afford to be naive anymore I needed to be strategic, to think about my own well-being first. But even as I considered these options, there was a part of me that hesitated. Was this really who I wanted to become? Someone who viewed his marriage as a transaction, who sought to profit from his wife's betrayal. The lines between self-preservation and revenge were starting to blur, and I wasn't sure where one ended and the other began. For now though I knew that I couldn't continue as things were. The decision to leave wasn't easy, but it felt inevitable. After weeks of living in a house filled with tension and unspoken words, I realized that I couldn't continue pretending everything was okay. The emotional distance between Emily and me had grown into a chasm that seemed impossible to bridge. Every time I looked at her, I was reminded of her betrayal, and every time she tried to reach out to me, it only deepened the wound. I needed space space to think, to breathe, to figure out what the future held for me without the constant reminder of what I had lost. Packing my bags was a surreal experience. I had lived in this house for years, and it was filled with memories of our life together. But now, those memories felt tainted, overshadowed by the knowledge of what had happened behind my back. I didn't take much, just the essentials. It wasn't about starting a new life somewhere else it was about escaping, at least for a while. As I closed the door behind me, I felt a mix of sadness and relief. Leaving wasn't just about creating physical distance, it was about taking the first step toward reclaiming my own life. In the days following my departure, the silence in my new place was both comforting and unsettling. Without Emily around, there was no one to argue with, no one to remind me of the pain. But at the same time, the solitude forced me to confront my emotions head on. I wasn't sure what I expected maybe that the distance would help me see things more clearly, or that I would find some sense of peace. But instead, I found myself consumed by a sense of loss, of something irrevocably broken. Emily, meanwhile, refused to give up. She sent me message after message, pleading for me to come home, to talk, to try and work things out. She apologized over and over, insisting that we could rebuild what had been shattered, that we could find a way to move forward together. But every message felt like a dagger, reopening the wounds I was trying so hard to heal. I didn't want to hear her apologies, I didn't want to hear how sorry she was. What I wanted what I needed was something she couldn't give me the ability to turn back time and undo what had been done. As the days turned into weeks, Emily's messages became more desperate. She told me she couldn't imagine life without me, that she was willing to do whatever it took to make things right. She begged me to give her another chance, to come home and try to rebuild our life together. As the days passed in my temporary refuge, I found myself caught in a whirlwind of conflicting emotions. The pain of Emily's betrayal was still fresh, and I was grappling with how to move forward. Our separation had given me the space to reflect on what I truly wanted and needed. The idea of reconciling with Emily seemed increasingly untenable the trust between U.S. had been irreparably damaged. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling that if there was any chance to salvage our marriage, I needed to approach it differently. My thoughts turned to finding a way to heal my own wounds, while also addressing the fracture in our relationship. It was during these reflections that an unconventional idea began to take shape in my mind. Emily's sisters, Emma and Kate, had been integral to the business's recovery, and our relationship with them had evolved during that period. I had always respected them, and over time, our interactions had become more personal. The idea was jarring, but as I considered it more deeply, it seemed to present a solution that could potentially satisfy both my need for emotional resolution and my desire to maintain the marriage. The proposal I began to entertain was both radical and deeply personal what if, as part of rebuilding our relationship, I had the opportunity to sleep with Emily's sisters? The notion was not born out of a desire for revenge or retribution, but rather from a need to address my own emotional wounds in a way that was both honest and practical. If I were to remain in the marriage, I wanted to find a way to heal and assert my own needs within it. It was a way to assert control over the situation and regain a sense of power that I had lost. The more I contemplated this proposal, the more it seemed to offer a unique kind of resolution. If Emily was truly committed to making amends and rebuilding our life together, then perhaps she would be willing to agree to this arrangement as a means of demonstrating her dedication. 
It wasn't just about physical intimacy it was about redefining the terms of our relationship and finding a way to move forward that acknowledged the complexities of our situation. I needed to test whether Emily's commitment to our marriage was strong enough to accept such an unconventional solution. I knew that proposing such an arrangement would be fraught with emotional complications. The idea of asking Emily to agree to this was daunting. I imagined the conversation and how it would unfold how I would explain my reasoning and hope that she would understand, or at least accept, the unconventional terms I was suggesting. It would be a delicate negotiation, one that required careful consideration of how to frame my proposal in a way that would not only address my own needs, but also take into account Emily's feelings and the future of our marriage. Ultimately I realized that this proposal might not be a perfect solution, but it was a way to confront the situation head-on. When I finally presented my proposal to Emily, the reaction was one of shock and disbelief. The air between us seemed to crackle with tension as I laid out my thoughts. Emily's face drained of color as she struggled to process what I was asking. I could see the turmoil in her eyes, the internal battle between her love for me and her loyalty to her sisters. It was clear that my suggestion was more than she had anticipated, and the weight of it was almost too much for her to bear. In the days following our conversation, Emily became increasingly distraught. The burden of the situation weighed heavily on her, and it became evident that she was torn between her own emotions and the responsibility she felt toward her sisters. One evening, after an especially difficult day, she broke down in tears, her sobs echoing through the empty house. It was a heartbreaking scene, and I could see just how deeply my proposal had affected her. Emily's desperation led her to make a heartfelt and tearful appeal to Emma and Kate. She approached them with a heavy heart, knowing that this conversation would test the very fabric of their relationship. The request was laden with emotional weight as she explained the gravity of our situation and the depth of her commitment to saving our marriage. Through her tears, she conveyed the pain and regret she felt and how important it was for her to try and make amends in whatever way she could. She reminded them of everything we had been through together the long hours, the financial sacrifices, the emotional toll. Emily spoke of how much their support had meant to us and how we had all worked tirelessly to save their business. Her voice wavered as she described how the proposal was not just a matter of personal need, but also a chance to repay a debt of sorts. She framed it as a way to honor the efforts we had all made, to acknowledge the sacrifices that had been part of this journey. Emma and Kate listened with a mix of shock and sympathy. The request was difficult to process, and their initial reaction was one of hesitation. They were deeply affected by Emily's plea and the raw emotion she displayed. The situation put them in an incredibly challenging position, forcing them to reconcile their personal feelings with their sense of duty. Emily's appeal was not just about convincing them to agree to the proposal it was about reaching into their hearts and appealing to their sense of fairness and responsibility. Emma and Kate faced a moral and emotional dilemma that seemed almost insurmountable. Emily's heartfelt plea had laid bare the intense pressure she was under, and her tearful appeal had made it clear how much this proposal meant to her and to me. The weight of the situation was heavy, and the sisters were deeply conflicted. They were grateful for the support I had provided them during their time of need, and they understood the magnitude of what was being asked of them. Yet, the request was deeply unconventional and fraught with emotional complexity. In the quiet moments following Emily's plea, Emma and Kate discussed the situation at length. They debated the implications of agreeing to the proposal and the impact it might have on their own lives as well as on the broader dynamics of our family. They were keenly aware of the moral and ethical challenges posed by such an arrangement. No matter how much they valued the help I had given them, the idea of engaging in such a personal and intimate act was difficult to reconcile with their own values and beliefs. Despite the internal conflict, the sisters' gratitude for my support weighed heavily in their decision-making process. They recognized that without my intervention, their business and their financial stability might have been irreparably damaged. Emma and Kate knew that I had made significant sacrifices, both financially and emotionally, to help them through their crisis. This acknowledgement of their debt created a strong sense of obligation, compelling them to consider the proposal more seriously. After much deliberation, Emma and Kate reached a decision. They chose to agree to the proposal, though their acceptance was tinged with a profound sense of discomfort and unease. They understood the complexity of the situation and the potential emotional fallout but they also felt an obligation to honor their debt to me. They were willing to accept the proposal as a means of acknowledging the support I had provided and as a way to try and mend the strained relationships within our family. As the weeks passed since the agreement, 
I found a peculiar sense of satisfaction in the new dynamics of my relationship with Emily and her sisters. The unconventional arrangement we had settled into provided me with a sense of control and fulfillment that I hadn't felt in a long time. The emotional wounds inflicted by Emily's betrayal had begun to heal in a way that I hadn't anticipated. The intimacy with her sisters, though complex and fraught with its own set of challenges, allowed me to reclaim a part of myself that had been shattered. Sleeping with Emily and her sisters was both a testament to the new boundaries we had established and a way for me to regain some semblance of power within our relationship. It was a way of taking back control, of asserting my own needs in a situation that had left me feeling powerless. Each intimate encounter, while not without its emotional complexity, also provided a form of validation and satisfaction. It was a tangible way for me to address the emotional scars left by the betrayal, to affirm my own sense of worth and agency. The arrangement had also led to a remarkable shift in the dynamics of our household. The business, which had once been a source of immense stress and financial strain, began to flourish. The efforts we had put into saving and revitalizing it paid off, and it became a success story that was the envy of many. Emily and her sisters played their parts diligently, and the positive changes in the business seemed to mirror the new equilibrium we had established in our personal lives. The financial stability and growth provided a much-needed boost to our confidence and sense of achievement. Seeing the business thrive was a source of pride for me. It was a testament to the hard work, dedication, and sacrifices that had gone into turning it around. The success of the business also reinforced my sense of control and accomplishment. It felt like a validation of the choices I had made and the paths I had chosen. It was as if the universe was rewarding my perseverance and resilience, both in terms of professional success and personal fulfillment.